bringing the people behind our food to life. I come from the East Coast, grew up in Brooklyn, New York, worked as a volunteer from the, my, when I was eight to nine to 10 to 11, 12, something like that, as a, on Saturdays in the Brooklyn Botanical Garden in the orchid house. And uh, so I learned about orchids when I was a kid. My father and I got together and we had a little greenhouse filled with orchids. And Education, I did a project for the science talent search in which I put some culture scene in a tube with some roots of an epiphytic orchid and it doubled the chromosome number and you could see some of the mitotic figures if you stain the slides. And so I did that as a project when I was 14. So that's where I went to school in Erasmus. 4,000 in the, in the school, 1,000 in the class. And I, I was uh, president of the chess club for a year, but I wasn't a very good player. Uh, one day a guy kid came home with me and I said, Ma, this is the only kid I can't beat in chess. His name was Bobby Fisher. I went to college at Yale in biology. And I graduated when I was 19. And I did a project my last year on the genetic complementation of a red bread mold, of looking at color mutants and putting together two white mutants in the same culture dish and having it turn orange like the wild type. And so I did some prim preliminary genetics and I learned about carotenes and pigments. And, and uh, then I, uh, because I did this project with the color mutants as my senior project, I got some data that I started analyzing in a way that people hadn't done before and then it turned out there had been a bunch of other work that had been done that nobody could figure out and if I did what I figured out to their work, all of a sudden I found something that had all the same pattern. Got me into graduate school. So then I went to graduate school for six years in, and I was very, again, not a good student, but I had an interest in getting intensely involved in something and reading about it and cooking with it in my mind, thinking about it. and and eventually something would happen out of it. So it got me into graduate school and I had a chance to remedy my lack of knowledge of mathematics, of physical chemistry, of uh, biochemistry. I knew molecular biology. That somehow, but I didn't know how organic chemistry determined the behavior of molecules and what the molecules were built like. So I didn't know about the body, about DNA and RNA and how the molecules are built and how you end up having a parentage and genetics and lineages and all these creatures on the world. So the inside stuff, I had no good background. So I spent man, three years doing that and then started doing research in nucleic acids, making new kinds of nucleic acids, isolating enzyme from microorganisms and, and learning how DNA makes DNA and DNA codes for R, makes RNA and how you make proteins and how 20 amino acids make proteins and how we, our bodies now we know have 22,000 genes, about 10,000 proteins get made. Uh, how our DNA is built has been a revolution in our lives that has changed the way we understand how our bodies work. So prior to the genomic revolution of knowing all the human chromosomes with all the genes, about a thousand genes on a chromosome, 22 pairs of chromosomes plus the, the XY chromosome, 23 uh, pairs, and you begin to understand the fabric of life in a different way when you look at a cell Inside a cell, you find a nucleus, a DNA. You take the DNA and you analyze it and you can tell that one of those genes came from a yeast that grows in the water uh, and is the gene actually gave rise to the lens of your eye. That you begin to see the parts of your body aren't just ours, but they're parts of other parts of the living world. And the living world, when you go in our intestine now, they call it the human metagenome. There's a thousand kinds of bacteria in everybody's intestine. Everybody has somewhat different ones depending on what they eat and what their genetics are. And if you give birth by uh, natural birth delivery, the, your child is healthier than if you get a cesarean because the bacteria from the mom are communicated to the baby and she gets a boost, the baby, he, she gets a boost in immune healthy microbes that we previously we've been calling germs, but we're only beginning to understand are part of every cell in our body. So it took a while before you look in a cell, you see a nucleus, you see these little bodies all around it called mitochondria that make the energy of the cell. They're bacteria. And that's real. That's bacteria. You look at the green leaves on the plants and you look in the green and you find out that 
bacteria, cyanobacteria in the leaves. So we understand that actually the cells and their structures have components of other organisms, and we are an, uh, like the chimera of the Egyptians, only they didn't know about bacteria, viruses, in those kind of ways. But that's what we've understood about, uh, when you ask the question about, give me an idea of your uh, education or what your sequence of interests have been. So <clears throat> I got into that six years in molecular biology, biochemistry uh, in graduate school. And uh, then I uh, had two years or a year, I worked in Europe uh, at the Russia uh, to do uh, biochemistry with Mick uh, Mickelson brilliant man who had first determined the structure of ATP, which is the primary energy molecule of our cells. So I was at that place uh, where the revolution in consciousness happened with psychedelics, with cannabis, with the uh, protesting the Vietnam War, where the whole bunch of people rose up against the status quo militarism and violence that our society has been propagating and started to say, we need to change the way we are in this world if we're going to inhabit it in a way without destroying it. And now, many years later, we see we've been destroying forests, waters, mining, logging, activity, coal, radioactivity, uh, petroleum, these are polluting and destroying our world. Our agriculture is doing the same thing. It is monoculturing huge tracts of land, turning what was a, a place of great diversity into homogeneity and monoculture using poisons systematically that are in the biosphere come back to haunt us by chronic diseases. You know, one of the things you learn in, in the academic world, in insertion in molecular biology or biochemistry, is how to poison things real well. So they set you up, you learn how to poison things right away, you come into agriculture and everybody's using poisons, they just don't know what they're doing. But you know what poisons are because you figured out in your own right a whole bunch of new poisons for the, that's how they say, you're good. You just figured out how to kill that enzyme or to poison that system or to, you know, that's part of the, the genetical system is knowing how to do that. And but yet you get to agriculture and all of a sudden you realize, I want to feed my family, I don't want to use poisons. I don't want to poison the water. I don't want to do these things that are common ground as saying it's okay because it's efficient, because it's effective, because it works quickly, because you don't have to have a large agrarian class in your society who does a lot of field work. Well, what is wrong if we change our view about how valuable it is to work in the field? And the fields were multi-diverse, and when you worked every day there were different plants and different things to learn, and it was a much deeper, more fulfilling aspect of life. You collected the seeds. You just didn't grow tomatoes. You saved the seeds of your favorite ones. And you passed it on to your great-great-grandchildren because it was a great variety. That's what we care about.